Welcome here to the University to Snell Library at the University Libraries of uh, Northeastern. Um, this is one of a number of collaborations that the university libraries have with groups on campus, and this time we're really happy to be collaborating with the Center for Community Service here on campus. Uh, I should, before we go any further, say a few words of thanks to the to the people who've put the program together. Um, uh, Sarah Kaplan and Rebecca Morton from the uh, Center and Maria Carpenter and Emily Sabo from uh, from the libraries have worked hard f f to to bring this event to fruition, along with the members of the libraries' uh, programming and communications committee. Uh, that's a group that w runs a, a number of events in the library, and you can find out more about that uh, from the library website or becoming a member of the library supporters group. And we have some. Uh, handouts here that we'll be happy to share with you to uh, to allow you to plug into the range of events that take place in the library uh, of this sort. Um, so, so we're here today uh, to enjoy the benefits of uh, learning more about the topic under discussion here. One of uh, one of the focus forums that the center regularly organizes. Focus forming opportunities for collaboration, understanding, and service. So this is an opportunity for members of the Northeastern community to learn more about the sorts of issues uh, and inform themselves about the issues that affect our neighboring Boston community and provide you with the, uh, with the resources to, uh, to serve the community um, and, to, and to act on that knowledge. So that's a particularly crucial uh, mission, given the very sad circumstances that we're all aware of uh, with, the, with the very recent death of a Northeastern student. And while I don't think that issue is absolutely central to the topic of the discussion today, I'm, s I'm sure it's something the panelists will, will want to mention and give you an opportunity to talk about in the question and answer session that, uh, that will uh, follow the panel discussion. And we're really glad to see all our panelists here now. <laughs> Two thirds of them are particularly glad to see the remaining third. <laughs> uh, and I'm not going to take time now to introduce the panelists. I'll let them do that for themselves. But Jack, Alex, and Emmanuel, I'm sure, have a whole range of uh, views and, and information to bring us on this top topic. The speakers are going to each talk, and then we'll, we'll be happy to open the floor for a, a more general discussion. So once again, Welcome, thank you for coming, and gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you. thank you very much, Dean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, there is an unhappy coincidence, as you know. We lost a, uh, a student uh, to homicide, and, and I'm sure you realize that this uh, event was planned months before that happened, and uh, just a terrible coincidence. Um, and I, I'm going to talk in general terms, and if you see some uh, relationship to the tragic event, so much the better. But I'm not going to focus directly on it. I think it's cer certainly too early to do that. Um, I've been studying homicide for more than 25 years. And um, I focus a great deal on murder as a, as a measure of criminal violence uh, for a couple of reasons. The first one is pretty obvious, I think. Uh, most people would regard murder as the most serious form of violence, uh, I think along with uh, rape. Uh, and that's certainly a reason to focus a lot on murder. But the second reason I think is just as important, and that is that murder is our most reliable measure of criminal violence. Uh, you can hide an aggravated assault, an assault with a weapon, say. In fact, sadly enough, police departments under pressure to have rosy crime statistics have been caught doing that and what they'll do is they'll ca ca 
categorize uh, a, an aggravated assault as a simple assault, which, which uh, excludes it from the serious crimes that are reported to the FBI, making their uh, crime statistics look pretty good. Uh, in St. Louis recently, uh, it was discovered that some of the police officers were actually uh, uh, taking rapes of prostitutes and filing them away in a memo in a file drawer and not reporting them, which made their rape statistics look pretty good over the, for, over the period of a year. And, you know, Boca Raton and in, in Atlanta, a lot of police departments have, have tried to, in one way or another, uh, take, take uh, uh, liberties with their statistics of violent crime making them look better. But it's kind of hard to hide the corpse. I mean, yes, it, it does happen once in a while, but most of the time, uh, if there's a homicide, somebody is going to know about it sooner or later. And so it is a very reliable measure of criminal violence. Now, uh, it turns out that the United States has the highest murder rate, that is the number per 100,000 population, among the Western industrialized countries. Uh, actually, we, we're, our murder rate is five times higher than in Switzerland or Japan. But it's, uh, and, and, and some of that has to do with the availability of firearms, especially handguns. Uh, but it's not all guns. Uh, the U.S. non-gun homicide rate is also higher than the overall murder rate by any kind of weapon, including guns, for many other countries. Look, look at the 3.7 uh, per 100,000 population non-gun rate, that is murders committed with, with knives and, and, and with, with bludgeonings, hammers, strangulation, and so on, uh, that's, um, it's almost four times uh, that of Japan, and twice as, as high as that of France. So it's not all guns. When I try to explain the high murder rate in this country, I look at four things at least. The first thing is our love affair with guns. Uh, we have 200 million handguns on the streets and in the hands of people who shouldn't have them in some, some cases. So guns really do make a difference, but it's not the only difference. Uh, you're going to see that difference in a few minutes when I look at trends in murder in this country. But there's also the subculture of violence and what I call the eclipse of community. And finally, income inequality. And just for a few moments, I want to go over each of these. First of all, the subculture of violence. Uh, if you look at where murder occurs, uh, and, and this is over many decades, you'll see that the capital of homicide continues to be the Deep South. Uh, states like Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, uh, to some extent Texas and Arkansas uh, and Alabama, these are states that have inordinately high homicide rates. Uh, especially in the rural areas, and, and, and traditionally uh, criminologists have blamed this, some of them have blamed this on uh, what is known as a subculture of violence, meaning that in these particular areas, violence is not only acceptable, but it's demanded, it's required. When, when your respect and dignity are being challenged, you are expected to retaliate, and often through the barrel of a gun. Uh, that, that subculture of violence can also be seen in some major city neighborhoods where poverty runs rampant. So it's not just in rural areas. And we're seeing more and more of that in large cities where people are disrespected. And, and just that breakdown in respect uh, may trigger literally trigger a fatality. Uh, so that's the subculture violence. Before I continue, let me just point out that uh, it may not actually be the subculture of violence because these are the same areas that have in, uh, a lot of poverty. 
And we know that crime and poverty are related. You may not know that, you may know that, but they are, I can assure you. And so the same places that had the, 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 the subculture of violence also were very impoverished areas. Which one is it? We really don't know for sure. And then, I, you know, I've been studying mass murder uh, f for more than 25 years. Uh, murders in which there are at least four victims who are, uh, who are killed simultaneously. And it's very interesting that mass murders are underrepresented in the Deep South, the very places where you would expect more, not less, yet they have very few multiple homicides. You know, most of their, their murders are mur murders over an argument. You know, two friends go into a bar, one pulls out a gun and, and shoots the other after some heated confrontation that starts as something verbal and becomes physical. Uh, that kind of uh, a scenario almost never happens in a mass murder. It's planned, it's premeditated, uh, it's not something that occurs because two friends have an argument. Uh, actually, it wouldn't wor work that way anyway because it wouldn't be mass murder if there were two friends. It would have to be four or five friends. One has a gun, the others don't, and they all die, except the one with the gun. But uh, if you look at this, it's quite interesting that, the ma that mass murders are disproportionately represented in states like California, Alaska, Texas, Oklahoma, New York State, Illinois, Florida, and these are states with a lot of strangers. These are states that have a very, uh, very little sense of community. You know, think about it. Somebody from Boston travels thousands of miles, goes west, young man or young woman, uh, to California for the sake of a new beginning or a last resort, a, a job that pays better, or any job if in, in a recession, and, and, and gets, to the, gets to San Francisco or Los Angeles and doesn't have his support systems in place when he gets into trouble. He's left his family and friends back home in Malden. I heard somebody was from Malden, so I said that. I, who was from Malden? Anybody here? Yes, okay. <laughs> and, and now is alone in a social psychological sense. He's a nomic. He doesn't have guidelines for his behavior. And there, you know, there's a guy named Robert Putnam who wrote a book several years ago called Bowling Alone. And he meant that as a, literally, I mean, people don't bowl in groups anymore. There used to be bowling leagues. Now people go by themselves if they bowl at all. And then he meant it as a metaphor for this collapse of community. People just don't have anyone to encourage and support them in a group. And by the way, it's not just, pe I don't want to spend a lot of time with this, because, but it's not just people who travel or relocate who are in this predicament. Um, a lot of people don't even know who their neighbors are. And they've lived there for years. I live in a single family house in the suburbs. And this is true. Uh, one day I was at uh, Ruggles and I was going to take the commuter rail home. And uh, a guy walks up to me and he says, are you Jack Levin? I said, yeah, how do I know you? He said, oh, my name is, <laughs> he said, my name is Bill. I forget his last name. He said, I'm your next door neighbor. <laughs> Honestly, I said, oh, really? Oh, yeah, right, right. I said, Bill, what color is your house? He said, white. It's the house right next to you. I said, oh, yeah? How long you lived there? Six months? He said, I've been there five years. I said, welcome to the neighborhood. What, what was I going to say to Bill? I haven't seen him since. That was three years ago. So I, maybe he moved. Not sure. And I'm not the Lone Ranger in this regard. There are lots of people who simply don't have neighbors they know. Uh, their friends may come from their working relationships, you know, in the office, if they have any at all. So there has been an eclipse of community. And the places that have a lot of strangers also have a lot of weird, weird murders, especially mass killings, big hate crimes, uh, uh, serial killers on the loose. And, 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 and I want to tell you one thing, and then I'm going to move on. You want to be safe? Don't move to California. It is a, and I'm not talking about the earthquakes, I'm talking about social earthquakes. And then finally, income inequality. Uh, you know, we've suffered 
uh, gradual increases in, in income inequality uh, from 1970 through the present. Almost every year there has been a shrinking of the middle class. Almost every year since 1970 there, there have been uh, more really rich people and really poor people with not many in between. You know, and uh, we've, we've had other eras when, when we've had lots of poverty. The, Great Depression when there was a 25% unemployment rate, but the homicide rate didn't escalate as much because everybody felt as though they were in the same boat. You know, now there are some people who think they're in leaky rowboats, and then there are others who think they're in big yachts, and you know, it, it, nothing much in between. And that kind of income inequality, uh, if, if if you compare country by country. Is, is, is certainly closely related to uh, high homicide rates. And uh, countries like Mexico and Russia, South Africa isn't in here. Boy, theirs is off the chart. Income inequality and homicide. Uh, the United States is up there as well. And these are countries that have a, 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 you know, high income inequality and very high homicide rates. Well, now I'd like to shift our attention for, for a few minutes to how the murder rate has changed in the United States. And uh, it's quite clear, let me just see something. Oh, I just wanted to give uh, credit, uh, Jamie Foxx is, is responsible for constructing for the Bureau of Justice Statistics the, the following uh, five uh, uh, graphs. And this one really uh, tells us quite a bit. And this looks at uh, the murder rate from 1950 through 2005, the rate per 100,000 population. If you look at the 1950s, take a look at how low the homicide rate was. Uh, this was the leave it to beaver generation. And we really didn't have a lot of murders in this country. And then in the middle 1960s, everything started to change. That that's when the baby boomers, you know, ultimately 76 million of them, were in their teenage years in the violence-prone age group, and 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 they were uh, not only were there were they present in large numbers, but there was this kind of revolutionary spirit during the late 60s, early 70s, and from from about 1960. Up, do you want to know how the cult of age worked during that period of time? I swear this is true. The Oil of Olay commercials said, can you tell that she's over 25? And there was a television program weekly called Logan's Run, which was about a, a people who reach 30 years of age and have to be exterminated. Uh, that, that was considered old age. You know, and, and there was even, do you remember that old novel, Soylent Green? Yeah, well, what did they do to old people? They made fortune cookies out of them. That's what they did. But anyway, so from, during that period of time, everybody wanted to be young. Everybody wanted to be a teenager. 85-year-old women were wearing mini skirts because that's what you did when you were a teenager. It was unbelievable. It's, it, you know, it's laughable now because it seems so implausible. And yet, it was definitely the case. And then, Look what happened to the homicide rate. It continued to climb until 1980, okay? And then all of a sudden in 1980, predictably based on that one variable, the age structure of the population of the United States, it went the opposite direction. It started to decline. So that makes sense. The baby boomers were getting older. They were maturing out of their Teenage years, they were now middle-aged people, and they had graduated uh, uh, from street crimes into uh, lower-risk white-collar crimes like embezzlement and fraud. Yeah. T entirely predictable. And then, sh this was the shock. In 1986, take a look. 1986, the murder rate escalated again. What? The baby boomers were still getting older. They hadn't all died off. Now they were in their 40s. What is going on here to make the murder rate escalate once again? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. 
The answer is the war on drugs. In the 1980s, Ronald Reagan fought the war on drugs, which created a war on the streets of our major cities. What happened is that he incarcerated larger and larger numbers of street-level drug dealers, and thereby creating a vacuum in the drug industry. Guess who filled it? Teenagers, their younger brothers, 14, 15 years of age. And, and they got into the crack cocaine business, and if you're in the crack cocaine business on the streets, you need a gun, you need protection, you need to, something to defend yourself. So all of a sudden we saw the, the, the presence of more and more firearms in the hands of 14-year-old of kids who couldn't shoot straight. And as a result, we saw people spraying bullets into crowds and more innocent people uh, being killed on the streets by, by uh, firepower that just went astray. These were all handguns, not semi-automatics. How do you put a semi-automatic rifle in your trench coat or even in your jacket and go to school? Uh, most of the, the, the small caliber handguns were much easier to conceal and therefore uh, they were quite prevalent on the streets. And by the way, I want to get ahead of myself and just show you something amazing, shocking. 1992, 93, what happens to the murder rate? Again inexplicably, unpredictably, it plummets. It plummets and continued to do so until the beginning of this century when it plateaued. I want to just break this down a little bit. If you look this, you're going to see a lot of what we call pretty close to normal curves here. You can see that the murder rate uh, escalates and then it declines uh, among 18 to 24 year old. They, we used to call that the violence prone age group. But, but, but look at 14 to 17 year olds. They, they look a lot like their older brothers. 14 to 17. They also have a normal curve. Meaning the, the rate of murder escalates and then it plummets. Just like what happened to their older brothers. And, and the demographics are so clear. The baby boomers who are now really getting much older Look what happens to them. Take a look at 25 or older. It the murder rate continues to decline. So, you know, the demographic, the, the power of demographics can be seen here very clearly. But the scary thing is that 14 to 17 year olds were now committing murders the way that their older brothers used to do. And it, it's not just age. The entire increase in the murder rate until about 1992, and then the subsequent decline in the murder rate from 92 into this century was murder committed with handguns. There was absolutely no increase with knives or hammers or you know, blunt objects it's called, or, or, or strangulation, or even uh, rifles, uh, semi-automatics, no. No rifles. It's all handguns. The entire increase and subsequent decrease by handguns. Young people with handguns. And finally, it didn't happen in the suburbs. It didn't happen in small cities. It didn't happen on farms. The entire increase and subsequent decrease was in major cities, big cities. We're talking about big city murders. Everything else was pretty much constant over that period of time. And I want to show you also that, it, that, sure, there were variations by region, but in every region of this country you saw the same phenomenon, that increase, that decrease, that normal curve that is fair, almost symmetrical. Well, how in the world did we respond? And, and, and we did respond to this increase in the murder rate until about 1992. There were two big models that were, that were used by major cities across the country, and one of them is represented by zero tolerance policing in New York City, and the other, I call it the partnership model, and that was the Boston model. Both of these models were, were adopted by other cities across the country, uh, many of which had a lot of success, just like in Boston and New York. Let's look at New York first, zero tolerance policing. Okay, what happened in New York City is that 
the mayor and Bratton and, 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 and criminologists all argued for uh, more aggressive and confrontational policing. Okay? They wanted the police to make order where there was only disorder. Meaning that you don't wait until young people commit the major offenses. You arrest them for the minor offenses. Hey, stop playing that boombox so loud. You're disturbing the neighbors. And by the way, here's some soap and water. I want you to delete all of that graffiti that you spray painted on the walls. We're going to make order out of disorder. Now, that worked, as you're going to see. It worked fairly well. But there was a price that was paid. People don't talk about it. There were a lot of people in New York City who were very upset by this, even though it did work to bring down the rate of murder in, in, in the city. And that is because you also, when you ask the police to become more confrontational and aggressive, you also raise the level of police brutality. You raise the level of excessive force used by the police who were now more aggressive and confrontational. And there were a lot of residents of New York City who didn't like that, but it certainly did work. Take a look at the red line and you'll see that the murder rate in New York City plummeted. Uh, by the way, the yellow line that's below that is Boston, and Boston never had the high homicide rate that New York City had, and it also declined. But if you want to look at an absolutely amazing uh, decrease in the murder rate, you've got to look at New York City. It certainly did work to bring down the murder. I mean, let's, let's face it. New York City used to be seen as dangerous. It's not anymore, it's, whether it's true or not. It's seen as a safe city. And, and tourists, uh, even with 9-11 and everything else, tourists flock to New York City now. No question about it. But Boston used a different model, as I said, the partnership model, and it was two-pronged. Yes, there was the law and order part, part put more police on the streets and, and in homes uh, and in places where youngsters congregate and in crime hotspots around the city where they were most needed, and that's, that did happen. Uh, and, and, and somehow, let's get the members of the community to cooperate with the police, and, and, and let's, let's lock away incorrigible youngsters. Let the, the relatively few teenagers who are responsible for the vast majority of violent crime, let's, let's incarcerate them so they can't get to us. Well, that, that was part of the strategy. It really was. And it involved not only the police, but probation officers and clergy and a lot of other people who got into the act and collaborated. But that was only half of it. The other half was prevention. And what happened from 1992 on, there were more and more after-school programs, more midnight basketball, but not at midnight, in the afternoon. You'll see how important that is in a minute. Summer jobs for teenagers community centers, boys and girls clubs, peer mediators and tutors in the schools. Uh, everything and, and anything that could make teenagers give them some hope for the future and some adult supervision. And believe me, the adult supervision was, was, was absolutely needed. Just ask Glenn Pierce, from whom I took this, this graph, and he happens to be here now. Um, and, and take a look. This was this is 1992, but I assure you that things have not gotten better since. 57% uh, of our children and teenagers under 18 lack full-time parental supervision. Now look, there are plenty of parents who can afford to give their teenagers healthy alternatives to violence. They, they don't have to personally supervise them. They, they, they give them quality daycare if they're young. They give them after-school programs, athletic programs, music, art, drama, what we call the frills now. <laughs> right. Right. But we, what we should be calling them are violence prevention programs. But we don't see that. Anyway. Uh, so, that, but, and, and, and even children under six years old, 49% of them lack full-time parental supervision because of divorce and single-parent families and, 
and, and dual career families and so on. And because of this, the prime time for teenage crime became that period from 3 p.m. when the school bell rang and about 7 p.m. when mommy and daddy got home from work. During that period of time, teenagers lacked adult supervision. They were on their own. They were asked to fend for themselves. By the way, not only did the crime rate peak, but also the number of, of, of teenage uh, premarital pregnancies also peaked. Okay, yeah, I remember when I was a teenager in 1863, uh, when, I, when I was a teenager during that period of time, uh, we went to Lover's Lane. So I'll bet you a lot of you don't even know what a Lover's Lane is. And I, I, I'm going to tell you why you don't know in a minute. But we did. We'd get in the car, and we'd go off to some romantic place, scenic overview, and then I'd get in the back seat of the car with my date, and we'd have sex. Yeah, all right, this, this is true. <laughs> Believe it or not. Hey, l listen, I actually testified in an obscenity case, and they told me that I was an expert on sex. My, my wife doesn't agree, but you know, she, what does she know? What does she know? Anyway. <laughs> so, look, take a look at this. The prime time for teenage crime, between three and seven or thereabouts, and this is the time when teenagers are totally unsupervised. They come home from school, grab milk and cookies from the refrigerator, and do anything they want. They don't need lover's lanes, because they're having sex in mommy and daddy's bed. <laughs> and they can commit any crime they want, in and out, because no one is watching. And you know, people want to put curfews. Curfews at 11 p.m. I got a call from the D.C. area. There were teenagers invading the National Mall and robbing people. Teenagers, they were doing this. But they weren't doing it after 11 p.m. because they were asleep. You know, if you want to impose a curfew, take a look at these data. It's very simple. Put the curve, the 11 p.m. curfew on adults. <laughs> They're the ones who stay up and commit nasty crimes at 11 or 12 at night. <laughs> we need, well, it's true. And, 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 and if you want to do something about teenage crime, then, then impose a curfew at 3 p.m. Okay, that would help. That would help. <laughs> so, of course, that's not going to happen. Um, so, we need adult supervision, and that's what the partnership model of supplied in, in, in significant numbers so that, uh, so that it, it, we did very effective prevention programs involving parents and teachers and psychologists and clergy, business leaders and social workers and college students from Northeastern and police and probation officers all working together, collaborating to, to help bring down the rate of violent crime. Look, for 25 years we let our teenagers raise themselves. Then we were surprised when they didn't do a very good job. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No adult supervision. That is what was missing here. Now, I, I, I want to show you something at Northeastern. Uh, about nine years ago, a very wealthy alum and extremely generous and very, very decent, uh, wonderful guy, uh, Irving Brudnick, and his wife, Betty. Uh, Irving has uh, died two years ago. Betty is still very much alive. And they contributed money. And the first thing they did was contribute money to, for this course, Social Conflict and Community Service, which we've been teaching for nine years. I don't have a lot of time to tell you about it. I just want, to, want you to know that uh, this course, which is very, you, you have to sign up far in advance to get into this course because it you know, has a limited enrollment. But uh, each student goes out into the community for five hours and then spends two hours in the classroom. By the way, Gordon Rubrenovich, who happens to be here, uh, who is the director of the Brudnick Center. I'm the co-director. She's the director. That means she's my boss. And, and she, she is now doing the same program in Northern Ireland. And she did it last summer, and she's doing it this summer. And Northeastern students go there, and they get the experience of working in Northern Ireland in an area that involves social conflict and what to do about it and how to resolve it. Uh, some of the students here have done, 
have worked uh, in Project Hope, Family Shelter in Dorchester, Fair Housing Center of Boston, Community Change, Madison Park High School, Jewish Family Services, uh, Fenway Community Health, and so forth and so on. I, don't, I, 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 I'm almost, I think I'm, I've already run over my time, so I have to be careful. And It's all your fault, you know. You, you came. <laughs> I'm really glad you came, by the way. Uh, speaking of Emmanuel uh, and the Ten Point Coalition, that, that's where this all started. 1992, there was a funeral uh, at the Morning Star Baptist Church. This is the newly constructed one, not the original. Uh, on, on Blue Hill Avenue in Roxbury. Funeral for a youngster who was shot to death on the streets of Boston. And gang members invaded the funeral, started stabbing one, of, one young person. And you know, the, the clergy said, enough is enough, we're not gonna stand for this anymore. And that's where we got the 10 point coalition. And I'm not gonna spend any more time talking to you about this because Emmanuel will, but I want you to know that that's where the inspiration for this partnership model came from. If it hadn't been for the 10 point coalition, I don't think we would have seen that kind of change in the city that we did see. Look at all the anti-violence programs that happened afterwards, after the 10 point coalition. Teen empowerment, gang peace, Private, the Boston Private Industry Council contributed to summer jobs for teenagers. You know how many summer jobs there were for teenagers? Every summer we got between 10 and 11,000 jobs. I'm gonna show you how important that is in a minute. Uh, there are plenty of others that I could talk about, but uh, those are the ones that, that we had over a period, long period of time. And look what it did to the homicides in Boston. 1990, there were 152 murders in the city. That's right, 152. The reason I said it twice is because a lot of people think that we have an unprecedented rate of murder in this city now. It's not true. Last year we had 66, which is not good, and we can do a lot better. But it also is less than half of what we had in 1990. Those were the bad old days, okay? By 1998, 1999, there were only 31 homicides. We went from 152 down to 31. That's incredible. It, 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 even more incredible. In 1990, there were 39 murders committed by boys 14 to 17 years old. 39. By 1998, there were three. That's what we did with the murder rate in the city of Boston. Things could be better now. Look, they're, they're, they're not moving in the right direction, really, but um, they're certainly not the way they were in the bad old days in 1990 when it was really dangerous in this city. But here's the problem. Uh, we, we have poverty in the city, but we don't have as much as Detroit, Baltimore, DC, and a lot of other big cities, okay? In order to, you, for this program to be effective and to prevent more murders, we need something very important. We need the human and economic resources of the residents. The residents have to have what it takes to get involved. But how do you do that if you're in Baltimore? Ba ba Baltimore is about the same size as Boston. And almost every year they have 300 murders. 300 murders, okay? Why, because they're bad people? No, it has nothing to do with that. They're thoroughly impoverished. How do you expect businesses on the verge of bankruptcy to generate summer jobs for teenagers, okay? Let me tell you something. While Boston was generating 11,000 a year every summer, Baltimore was generating 3,000. City the same size as Boston. Maybe a little larger, actually, okay? So extreme poverty is, 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 can, can really uh, destroy the efficacy of this community approach and what we need, it, it sounds like a liberal, old-fashioned idea that comes from somebody who belongs in Jurassic Park with the other dinosaurs, but I'll say it anyway, we need federal assistance. There, there's no other way. There's no other, for cities that are thoroughly impoverished, we need the after-school programs, the summer jobs, the community centers, the lifeguards at swimming pools. We need to keep our, our, our kids in healthy, places and we can't do that 
unless we have the, 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 the uh, help of outsiders. And take a look. Unfortunately, the, the rate of violent crime is starting back up again. Why hasn't the good news continued? Well, first of all, after 9-11, we switched our priorities, started fighting terrorism and, we, and, and, and not violent crime on the streets. You know, we have a, it's a zero-sum game and we have a limited resource, a number of resources, and we threw them to terrorism. I'm not saying we were wrong, but I'm just telling you that's what we did. Uh, over the last several years, there's been the release of large numbers of inmates who were incarcerated on the war on drugs. Now they're back on the streets and without much hope for the future, with no job skills. They're getting back into the gangs. In many cases, they become the leaders of the gangs. What we used to call gangs the, the, and, and associated with the teenage years now become organized crime. And, and, and you know, you don't get out of the gang. Uh, budget cuts. Certainly there were budget cuts. What's the first thing that gets cut? Crime fighting. Uh, and, and we're about to go into another recession, I believe, and the same thing is happening now. A larger number of at-risk teenagers. These are the children of the baby boomers, the boomerangs. They're back in large numbers, and they are at risk. And finally, complacency. Uh, we solved that problem. That was the 1990s. We were concerned about juvenile violence. Those days are over. Let's move on now. Let's talk about seat belts and buses. Let, let, let's talk about anything but violent crime committed by youngsters. And that's what we're doing. We're resting on our laurels. We've become complacent. And that's why I'm so glad that I was invited to speak with you this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or should I say good evening? Um, you know, don't know what to say now since uh, <laughs> kind of stole my notes, but that's all right. No, Sorry. I'm just messing. <laughs> um, my name is Emmanuel Tickley. I am the program director for the Boston Ten Point Coalition. I've had the pleasure of, of, of being in my position for the last 17 months. Before then, I was with the Boston Urban Youth Foundation working with in partnership with the Boston um, School District, working with young people who were truant and had issues with going to school um, because of neglect and so many other factors. Um, so let me kind of go back to sort of the history of the Boston Ten Point Coalition. Uh, 1992, you heard the story. The young man, it was a funeral at the Morning Star Baptist Church. Um, you saw the, the, the large, illustrious building, but back then, um, the sanctuary was maybe just a little bigger than this room. Really, if you uh, take away the, the pulpit area, it's just about the size of this room. Um, young man, they were having his funeral. Sup supposedly, the young man who, who, who murdered him knew that his friends were going to be there, knew that, that the folks who they needed to get to were going to be mourning, and came in from all doors. Um, and a big melee ensued in the church, stabbing, fighting, um, you know. There's stories everywhere. Some folks say the casting was knocked over. Some said the, you know, the pastor jumped on the... I mean, there's so many different stories of what happened. But there was chaos. And there was fear. There was surprise from community members and pastors uh, and regular church-going folks of what's happening in our community. How, how would young men be either so brazen or so disconnected from respect that, that they would do this? Um, four pastors... Eugene Rivers, um, Pastor Hammond, Pastor Brown, and Pastor Bruce Wall all got together and came up with 10 points of how to reach young people and realized that young people on the streets need to be engaged with families, with churches, with other institutions. So they began to really do outreach. And, and they had no formula. They didn't know. These were people who were trained to speak over pulpits and to counsel and to reach their congregations. So they just started to go into the streets and connect with young people. I asked gang members and young folks who were selling dope, what do you need to get out of this lifestyle? Why are you being violent? And they just started finding answers and started connecting kids 
and realizing what was happening. But the other thing they knew is that there had to be a relationship with law enforcement. There had to be some type of connection between how communities are policed. So what they started to do was sit down with law enforcement and find out how we can work together. Um, I just came back last week from Grand Rapids, Michigan, where Boston Ten Point is helping um, the community of Grand Rapids figure out how to work together. Because even though, you know, me being a young man and thinking I've pretty much I came to college, I'm a New York kid, so you hear a lot of the stats about New York City and coming to Boston and going to school, you know, you, you see, kind of see the correlation. But I've been spoiled being in Boston. I've been really spoiled having to go to meetings with police officers and knowing them by the first name, right? And seeing a police officer, seeing a cruiser, and being able to identify who's who. And for me personally, drive down the street and not be afraid. Oh, I'm going 35, right? <laughs> and know that I may get pulled over and what the consequences will be. But in Grand Rapids, there's no relationships. The clergy don't have relationships with each other. The Baptists stay in the Baptist corner. You know, the, the, the Pentecostals stay in the Pentecostal corner. And, it, and the Dutch Reform, who, who run the show, you know, kind of stay up there in heaven. And, <laughs> and then when, when, you know, when it's time to fight, the gloves come off, ding, ding, and then they meet. The police don't really um, only know how to police one way, which is that they see you doing something small, they lock you up. Um, the school system was failing. They said that um, 70, in 70, 70, 75, 70 percent of the students are failing two or more classes in the entire school district. Now that blew my mind. That from, from kindergarten through 12th grade, 70 percent of all kids are, are, are failing two or more core classes. So you know, gyms, all A's, and we, but when they come to the core classes, they're failing. So bring that back to Boston. So the Boston Ten Point Coalition is chugging along. We're trying to figure out what to do. We learned a lot through osmosis. We learned a lot through talking to young people. And that's where Ten Point's models come from. All Ten Points came from the clergy sitting down with young folks on the corner and asking what their needs were. How can we help you? How can we connect with you? Some of the things that we do today are in direct response of young people. So let me kind of give sort of a, a brief program rundown of what we do at Ten Point. So Ten Point has nine programs. Before, you know, when I got there, um, there were about 15. <laughs> and uh, I just, it was crazy. And I just figured, you know, we need to really assess what we're doing and really serve young people and kind of narrow them now. So I'm going to kind of give, talk about three of them tonight, real, this evening, really. The first one is our Peace Project. Peace Project is our mediation and intervention project, where young, young, young folks we know are, who are warring with each other, um, over he said, she said, right? Young man is dating a young lady. And I'm just, I'm just kind of breaking down what most of the beef is about. Today it's not about drugs. It's not about territory. It's not about I'm moving into your territory because you're making some big sales over here. And I, it's, it's not about that. Young man and young lady are dating. She likes a certain swagger. He likes her, her appeal. You know, for whatever reason, he gets locked up. He's serving time. He's no longer connected to her, right? He's no longer that outside with that type of access. So she sees another guy who has a similar swagger. She likes him. He likes her. They start connecting and hooking up. And the young man who's in, in, in DYS doesn't know. He finds out third party from, from his friends, from somebody else. Uh, you know what's going on, dude. You know, do you check the information? Um, and now his issue isn't with her. Or they're not talking it out. His issue now becomes with that other young man. And when you have young people who've been neglected, who don't have adults to, to have proper supervision or to talk to them and help them figure things out in life, they don't know how to communicate. They deal with the, 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 the most um, apparent thing to them is, is violence. But Dr. Lean said, guns are apparent. Guns are here in our cities. Young people have access to guns. I would almost say that it's easier for a young person after hours to get a gun and get a book. Libraries close early, <laughs> but the streets are open, all right? Young, I know young people, they, 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 they can rent a gun in different neighborhoods, right? So it's, it's easier to get guns than it is for them to get, to get an alcoholic beverage. So these young, young men now have issues with each other and have no place to dialogue about it. 
So the next thing becomes when they see each other, they want to have a conversation. They do start off well. Yo, man, why are you disrespecting me? What you mean I'm disrespecting you? Yo, you know I was talking to Shorty. <laughs> oh, come on, man. What you mean? Yo, yo, she, yo, she told me that y'all were off. No, it wasn't. You know I was talking to her. Right? So the dialogue starts off really, you know, well, you know, except for calling her Shorty because they know her name. But they're still having dialogue about why I'm being disrespected because it's all about respect. Right? When you don't have money in your pocket, when you don't see hope, when you don't have, you, you see your dreams as a kid not, not going anywhere, the only thing you feel you have is, is your respect as a young man. So when that's being disrespected, that's where a lot of issues come from. So now you have young men who want to talk, but next thing you know, there's a fight that's ensuing. And a lot of it is because we found out as we talk to them, they want to have conversations, but they don't know where, they don't have a peaceful place to do it or they, do, they can't do it properly. Because we know that everybody wants, a lot of times folks want to see a fight. So there's always an instigator. Everybody knows the instigator? There's always somebody else. Once they get to a peaceful thing, no, nah, man, he didn't mean that. Come on, you let him say that to you? <laughs> so what we do is we partner with the police department, we partner with probation, we partner with clergy, lay people, we partner with the House of Corrections and DYS to get those group of guys in a neutral place that no one knows until the day of to sit down and have a conversation and dialogue. Sit down and have a conversation about what this beef about. How can we have peace? And, 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 and we use different methods there. The police and the DA can come in with the hammer. If you, you know, if you don't want to talk and if you want to keep doing the, 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 the shootings, this is what's going to happen. We can throw this at you, and we can have the feds, and we can do this, and we can do that. And we can bring in probation and make your life miserable. Put the, the brace, ankle bracelet on, you can't go anywhere. Right? And then clergy and, and, and teachers come in, and we have, what we do is we survey them and find out who did they respect when they were younger. Who did you respect when you were 12 or, or 13? And we try to go find those people. So we go find a teacher that they respected, or a principal, or a store owner that dealt with them respectfully, or a pastor, or a youth worker, or a bus driver. We've had to hunt down bus drivers, so we've partnered with the MBTA to find a bus driver who told this kid good morning every single morning when he went to school, and that meant something to him. And we bring those people in the room without telling them, and when they see these folks, the conversation changes. But these folks at one point in time believed in them and believe that they can, they can live and they can do great things. So we have those folks at the table, we leave the police officers outside the room um, because they change the dynamic of the conversation. Um, and we, we come up with a, with, a, with, a, with a solution that everybody can live by. It's peace, it's, you, know, you don't have to be friends, but you're gonna squash the beef. You're gonna allow each other to visit relatives and friends on each person's territory and area. So when you see them coming through, they're not there to violate or to get at you. Because grandmother actually lives two houses down the street, right? We're dealing with violence where um, some of these young men grew up in the same neighborhoods. They just moved away to another place. I had a situation where two young men used to sleep in the same bed, eat in each other's homes, call each other's mother's nana. And a couple months ago, they were shooting at each other. And every time they saw each other, they wanted to kill each other. And I think some of that had to go back, some of that dealt with going back to where, where, when they grew up. That they really loved each other, but to show their friends, or to hide that love, every time they saw each other, they became even angrier, and they had to really show it on, wear it on their vest to show their friends that, you know, he doesn't mean anything to me. My loyalty is, is to you. So we have our um, peace project, which is our gang mediation part of that. So one thing we had to figure out was, yeah, we're doing these mediation pieces with young men, but we didn't have an aftercare situation. We didn't have an aftercare model. Yes, we didn't have anybody that was checking up on them. So within a month, within six, seven months down the line, because we weren't constantly meeting with them to ensure things and really dialogue with them, little beasts were, were being recreated again. So what we did, we partnered with three or four churches in the area, and we looked at a map and said, where are all these young men coming from? And can we localize and keep them in their own areas? So we started to talk to some churches, and we, we started some CICs, 
some community intervention centers where young men can go to, they meet with somebody there every week, talk to them about, I need a job, I need to go back to school, can you connect me to a GED program? Um, I need to be, you know, I'm having issues with my, with my, with, like they say, my baby mama, and I need somebody to talk to, somebody to help me dialogue with her, because I get to a headway where I just I either want to hit her, or I just want to leave and have nothing to do with my kid. So help me be able to have those conversations and dialogues. So those are some of the other things that at the CICs that, that, that they do, and they help these young men just figure out some things about life, to get some life skills, to connect them to resources, and also be there at the inception of a beef, be there at the inception of something's about to happen in, 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 this, in this area. So those young men go there once a week, they connect with them. If they, do, if they are not there once a week, then that um, CIC coordinator is supposed to go find where they are and connect with them and let, do a report and let them know, well, Junior didn't come in today. I'm worried about him. I'm going to go find out. We meet once a month to coordinate with the police and find out, hell, what's the story about Junior? Because Junior tell, can tell me one thing, but I need to know what, what activity do you know is happening with him? Uh, what's going on with their crew? Do we need to press any issues? Anybody has to go to probation. So those are one of, the, one of our programs that we do. We just started a new program last year called the Grove Hall Youth Outreach Connection. One thing that 10 Point has learned, and one thing we do every year, we kind of evaluate what we do and figure out, is it working or is it not working, right? And I'm at the place where if it's not working, let's trim the fat. Let's, let's, let's remodel that, right? Let's not spend money and time and energy on things that don't work. So th this past year, we had a collaboration with uh, Mass Housing, um, uh, local organization in Grove Hall and Project Right and Boston 10 Point Coalition. And we got, we spoke to about six tenant associations to have youth workers have offices in those tenant associations and, and reach out to high risk and proven risk kids and connect with them where they are. So this whole model of being all over the city and having youth workers run all over the city wasn't working for us because young, youth workers weren't really able to have grassroots relationships with young people where they start to know a young person, they know their, their grandmothers, they know their mothers, they know their aunts and uncles, they know what's happening in the city and in, in their communities. So we uh, had a program called Grove Hall Youth Outreach Connection where we have teenage, we have youth workers that are right there in the moment with young people walking them through, they're advocating, they're coaching, and they're mentoring them. Last year, we started in May, and in June, we. Um, we started a, what we called a um, night games program in partnership with the Roxbury Y. One of the things that 10 Point does, we, there is no program at 10 Point where 10 Point does it alone. Everything we do is in collaboration with someone, in partnership with someone, because we've come to realize that no man's an island, that we're all a community, and that every player has something to do. Everyone has something to do. So Tuesday nights and Friday nights from 9 p.m. to midnight, we partner with the Y. Swimming, basketball, flag football, dance, double dutch, weightlifting, aerobics, life skills. Um, we play video games, we watch movies and documentaries and have discussions about it. Chess, we're bringing in, uh, partnering with Girls Row to have a, a row team in Grove Hall. Partnering with the police to do a um, basket, I mean, um, wrestling and, and, and boxing program. Um, so that young people can get to un know police officers and, and build some discipline, but also connect with them. Um, we're starting a debate team. So we're, we're going to be challenging some local high schools and suburban high schools and starting a debate team. We've actually started doing college tours because we have to start realizing that young people need to, to have dreams and they need to, to, to really see themselves in certain places. We know that uh, we did a survey and most kids in Grove Hall have never been to Cambridge. Most kids in Grove Hall have never seen the Charles River. And it's, it's, it's not that far away. We had some kids from Grove Hall who didn't know where Mattapan Square was. Mattapan Square is right down Blue Hill Ave going into Milton. But they said, I, I just had never had to go there. I, 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 you know, I go to school. I may go, excuse me, I may go downtown because if I have to cut through downtown to go to school. But I don't leave my neighborhood unless I have to. And then the only reason for a lot of our guys to leave your neighborhood was over beef. We got to go set it with them. So I'm going to go leave, get, get in the car, the hoopty, go deal with them and come back. So we realized that we got to get our kids outside of Grove Hall. We got to go down to, to Worcester. This is Worcester. 
we have to go to Springfield, the Basketball Hall of Fame. Let's go to Harvard. You know, let's, let's, let's go to Northeastern. They finish their GED classes and they're applying to college because they finally understand the connection between education, economics, life, work, career, community, family, engagement, and they understand how what they were doing, the crime, the violence, the drama, was ending up nowhere. And it was stifling them and taking away from their dreams and their lives. So one of the things that we're involved with 10 Point now is, whoa, how can we get every single young person connected to see where education fits into their life? How education is tied in to, to, to violence. How education is tied into poverty. How, no matter what your father did, you don't have to follow that same track. So that's really kind of what, what we're doing in our Grove Hall model is realizing that, and the only way we, I, we believe that we only came up with that solution because we started No Kids. Because we weren't running all over the city every time there was an act of violence and, and, and trying to save, save everyone because, you know, they, they've called 10 point. So how do we have youth workers planted in neighborhoods who are now getting to know residents and young people, and then young people can really open up about why I'm doing this or who, what I want to be in life. And then we have another program that we do we call the point of leadership, where we said that, take that back, I started going to community meetings. And if you know, most decision-making meetings happen between 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning. And well, who's not there? F parents aren't there, and youth aren't there. So all these community folks and who are getting paid to make decisions from the mayor's office, the governor's office, and every council in the world is making decisions about young people and their families. Right? The police go and the police say, how do we police? Now you have folks who are retired or who can afford to miss work saying, we don't, we don't want noise and I want my property value to go down. So I don't want writing on the wall, I don't want young people outside keeping noise. So the police say, hey, okay, we got that. They've gotten their mandate from the community on how to, com how to police the community. And they've got it from the folks who were there at that time. We've also, so you have young people not being involved, engaged in the process, and we have parents not being engaged in the process. So 10 Point came up with a partnership with the school department. If we have a council of young people that can get school credit to go to meetings, get some school credit to be involved in the process of their own communities, and find out where these young people live, and have them go to these meetings where decisions are made, and I don't want all eight kids. I don't want your, I don't want your best and brightest, or, well, you know, however you classify them as, as best and brightest. I want somebody with some swagger. I want somebody who gives you problems sometimes. I want a kid that you, when you see him coming in the hall, you go, oh my goodness, he's here today? Because I believe that young, that young person, when engaged in the process, and when they're here, and when they're opened up to what, what, what those processes are and what those, those things are, they start to change their life. They start to make conscious decisions about what, what am I doing? They're talking about me. Am I terrorizing the neighborhood? That, am, I, am I that scary? Is, is this really who I want to be? Because for so far, you know, when you have, when you're looking at something, and it's right here, you only see but what's here. But when you put it back and further away, and I can see more people. And when young people start to, to take away those blinders and hear other conversations other than, yo, she's fine, yo. Or yo, when I'm gonna get that, you know? Or I, yo, I need that splits. When I'm, when, let me get some. When you change your conversation and you're allowed to hear other things, your mind starts to transform. So we believe that our model of collaboration, because you know, Ten Point couldn't pull it off by themselves. We couldn't say, oh, you know, we just want a bunch of kids to come to something at nine o'clock and eleven o'clock in the morning. We had to go to the schools. We had to talk to them about it and sell them on it. And yeah, you know, we had to go back and forth and say, no. I don't want these kids. I want you to mix that up. I want at least 15 kids that you say when you see them, oh, oh, it's a rough day today. But those are the young folks that other kids follow. Those are the young kids that, that when, you know, so when, when we take, when we're training our youth workers, we say, go, go after the kid that when he walks in the room, everybody gets up to say hello. 
because that kid has influence. Yes, he may not be the right, have, you know, using his leadership in the right way, but if you influence him and if you show him certain things, he'll start to question and he'll start to embrace leadership in a different way. And he'll start to want to hang with you more than he hang with his boys because he's saying that I'm getting something valuable out of this. And those young people are now engaging conversations about how community process works with other young people. And they're starting to realize that they're the change. Not, we're not, we're, the change is coming. No, people in the community are the, are, are the change. So my challenge to everyone in here, especially the college students, all right, because a lot of times what happens is we, 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 um, you know, we, we graduate from high school, we go to college, and um, we sort of get further and further and further away from our communities. Right? We, you know, I challenged my friends, I went to college, I went to BU, uh, uh, you know, across, across the street, so, you know, I'm, I'm a Terrier fan. <laughs> no offense. But, but I challenge my friends all the time about making conscious decisions, because most of my friends grew up in urban areas, and most of them have left. Most of them have left and live in the suburbs. <laughs> See, for me, I'm a New York kid, so to me, Boston's a suburb. <laughs> I mean, Dorchester to me is this, it's, 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 you know, they have yards. You know, grow, <laughs> when I'm in Brooklyn, New York, I didn't know what a yard was. You know, I didn't. I didn't know what a share was. I went to college, didn't know what a share was, because, you know, concrete, we didn't, have, we didn't have grass, we didn't have lawns, we didn't have shrubs, didn't know what shrubs were when I came to college. But how do you engage young people who go to college for a better life to still be involved? and what's happening in the community. To still be involved in what's going on in Mission, in Mission Hill, Mission Park, Madison Park. So as I sit down, I challenge everyone here, even those of us who are older. How are you still involved in community? How can you be a part of a collaboration? Even if it's just your, your, just your thought. Even if somebody can call you and you're an expert opinion. Even if, if I have a, a young youth worker who I put in charge of uh, running a program. And as you know, when you, when you have money in terms of budget, and you have to figure out, do I give this to program? Or do I give to train a staff person? Guess what happens? That money goes to program for young people. And that staff person, for so much, has to wing it and figure things out on their own. So if, you, if, if you're a person who has some managerial skills or some business acumen, how, are you, how can you be of service to nonprofits and community members to help them think through things, help them think through conversations? Thanks for your time. So I guess if Emmanuel didn't know what to say, then I guess uh, after the both of them, I just put the student at the end there. Maybe I'll, I'll try to keep it, try to keep it short. Uh, so I'm Alex, and I run a student organization on campus. We actually founded it a few, a few years ago called Social Change Through Peace Games. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But since we are Peace Games uh, and we have a group of people, we are going to play a game to get us started here. So this game, it's, it's just a really quick, simple game. It's called Stand Up, Sit Down. Kind of get a poll of who's in the room. And if you're not comfortable standing up or you can't stand up, just throw your hand in the air and use that as the same thing. So when I, when I read a statement here, I'm going to say, stand up if. And if that statement holds true to you, you can just stand up. And then after we, after we take a look at the room, then we'll, we'll sit back down. And after every, after every time people stand up, then we're going to give them a round of applause. Any questions? All right. So if you are a Northeastern student or faculty member, please stand up. <laughs> Got a clap. There we go. All right. All right. You can sit back down. If you're from the local community, please stand up. 
All right, sit back down. If you came from outside of Boston today, if you came from outside of Boston, please stand up. All right, everyone can grab a seat. If you are a Red Sox fan, please stand up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so did, did they win today? They did, great. All right, let's give them another one. All right, if you're not a Red Sox fan, you're welcome to stand up, even though you're in Boston. All right, if you've done community work before in any way, shape, or form, please stand up. All right. All right. If you've ever worked with youth before, please stand up. All right, we've got a good room here. If you've ever had a role model in your life that, have hel that has helped you to make a positive decision, please stand up and stay standing for a minute. And when you're, when you're standing or raising your hand, please just think about who that person is. And when I count to three, you're going to shout their name out. One, two, three. Great. You're welcome to sit back down. If you've ever felt sad or angry before, please stand up. Good, good, all right, we're in tune with our feelings. All right, you can sit back down. If you've ever, if you've ever known a child or teenager or young adult before who you've seen sad or angry, please stand up. And stay standing. <laughs> stay standing if you've, if you've, ever, if you've ever helped somebody who's been sad or angry before, that's a young adult or a teen. Cool, great, sit back down. Please stand up if, you've, if you grew up feeling supported by your immediate or local community as a peacemaker or a problem solver. This is the last one. So if you've ever felt supported somewhere growing up as a peacemaker or a problem solver while growing up, whether it be by a teacher, a community member, a brother, a sister, anyone, throw your hand up, or, great, all right. Sit back down. So thanks for playing the, playing the game with us. Uh, we have a lot more exciting games, but I figured we are going to be in a room like this. So can everyone hear me in the back? Yeah. Great. All right. So uh, from, my, from my experience uh, in peacemaking and community engagement, uh, there's, there's a few very, very important pieces. And I think, I think we, in peace games, and social change through peace games, we do them really well. So I think the, the first one that's important is so you take a really holistic approach. So you could, I mean, you could have peacemaking once a week in a school. You could have one once a week after school program, and then you go home, and that's about it. Or if you have an approach that takes into account before school, after school, during the day, in class, out of class, community members, family members, members and you can do you can do all of that in a child's life in a community then you can be successful. So that's that's something we do here in peace games. We have before school programs, peace games classes, events celebrating peacemaking, workshops for parents and school staff, all those types of things. And some really key elements to that are skills, relationships and supportive opportunities. And this is something we talk about a lot. So skills, when I when I mean skills, what when when Michael or Jimmy or whoever is on the playground and they're, they get into a conflict. They have some concrete tools that they can use that they know whether they, whether they need to count to 10, whether they need to take, a, take some time away from a situation. They have some concrete tools to use. So skills is one important thing. Relationships is the second that we talk about. Relationships. So if you're in a school environment and there's community members, there's teachers, there's the administration, there's friends who all, who all have the same kind of conversation around peacemaking. We're all thinking the same thing. And that's, then that's, that's equally important, so you don't feel isolated. And then the last one is supportive opportunities. So a safe, you need a safe medium to, to really work, work and test out your peacemaking skills. But we do on the playground, we, we do outside at recess, places like that. So you don't have to feel like you're going to try it out for the first time in action. That there's, that there's places and there's people to support you with that. So those are, those are some of the really important pieces that I've, that I've come across in my time with Peace Games. And that's, that's kind of the reason why I'm, I'm here today, is this organization here. It started uh, 16 years ago by a group of Harvard students uh, working in the local community. A lot of them were from the local community. 
And today they're an international nonprofit organization working in LA, New York, Chicago, Fairbanks, Alaska for some reason, uh, <laughs> Colombia, and, and now just recently moving into the Middle East. And Peace Games, we, we, have, a, we have a kind of an underlying philosophy that con conflict is a natural part of life. You're not going to be able to get, get by that. You're not just going to be able to make everything peaceful. There's not going to be no conflict. But if, if children and community members can learn violence, learn how to be violent and angry, then they can also learn the skills of peacemaking. And that, that really underlies the, the thinking and the work that we do. So Peace Games, if you think about it, it's we're the, we try to be the difference in, in schools, the difference between putting metal detectors in when children get to high school and say, don't, just don't bring a gun, and, and as opposed to teaching kindergartners how to be friends. So that's, that's the difference. And we not only, we not only work in K-8 to schools in the community, but we don't only work with children. We don't only focus on children. Because if a child just gets taught peacemaking skills, that, that could do something for that child. But if they're not supported, like I said, then that, that doesn't get them very far. So we, we not only work with children, but we work with there's a child there. <laughs> we work with families, doing family events. We work with teachers. We work with, we do community events where we bring in community members. And we also do work with the local community like the firefighter you see in this picture here. So we, we really take a holistic approach. And that, and that we have found that be, that is very effective. If you, if you work with the child, if you work with their families, if you work with the staff in the building that they're with, eight hours a day, five days a week, if you work with the community members that they see and you, and you do special events celebrating peacemaking, then, then a community approach can be successful. So a few years ago, I, I started working with Peace Games at this school here. It's right up the street for any of you who know it. It's the Maurice J. Tobin School. And we saw, we, I, was, I was working with Peace Games and they were in their, their, last, their last year of the Peace Games program. Peace Games runs for three years. That's what they get grant money to do. And the, then the program, the staff gets, the, gets pulled out and the school is expected to sustain it. So that's, that's a good model except for in some cases that the, the school doesn't have the necessarily the resources to sustain the program. So we saw that need. And the school was going into the last year of the program. Uh, the children loved it. They needed, the, they needed this program. And we saw that this community approach is working. So we decided to start a student organization. Uh, in front of you, Northeastern students or faculty members, you might have heard about the Northeastern Shuffle. And that's kind of what it looks like there. And that's kind of where we were. There was a group of, uh, just a few of us, decided to start an organization to try to sustain this peacemaking program in the community. And we were underground for a while, not going to lie. We had, we had a, a few people. We were an organization, but Northeastern couldn't know about it until we became official. We finally surfaced. and. Uh, we expanded, we've really expanded over the last few semesters in the local community and here on campus to really make peacemaking and social change an initiative and something that, that people can really connect to and care about. So that's, that's where I started down there, I'm that little dot. And uh, then, we had, then we had a few people get together in the Tobin School there in fall of 06 and we've really, we've really grown the program since then. And now today we have 60 Northeastern students involved in peacemaking initiatives in these schools, teaching peace games, doing before school, after school, during the day programs. And we work with over 700 children and 60 staff members in these three schools, the Tobin School, St. Patrick's, and Cathedral. And that's, and, and that's I think, really been attributed to the, how we make peacemaking not only, not only something that is urgent and necessary, but fun with games and things like that. So, they're having a good time, but at the same time, they're, they're teaching valuable skills to, to children and they're working with community members. So that's, that's kind of the, the short of it. Uh, we, do, we do a lot of stuff in, in these schools. We do a lot, of, a lot of different programs. And I calculated it last night for some reason that we do about 42 hours a week of full-time peacemaking, or 40, 42 hours per week of peacemaking in each school. So we do, we do a lot of hours of work. But at the end of the day, a lot of people ask us, well, how do you know it's successful? So you go into schools, you play games with children, you do different programs, whether it be before school, you're trying to teach them tangible skills, you teach classes, all of those things. But how do you know it's successful? And so I'm going to share briefly a few success stories and why, why our model, why this holistic community approach has worked for us. So in the first example, there's an eighth grade class at the Tobin School. A bunch of students, really apathetic, don't really have a care in the world. Uh, actually, the first semester, during a Peace Games class, one student decided to pick the other student up on his shoulders and throw him through a table uh, during Peace Games. That didn't go over so well with the principal. But uh, 
over over the course over the course of the year, the Peace Games teachers have really worked with this group of students. Come back every week, and now over the last over the last few months, this these, this group of eighth graders have started working on a peace rap. So they've they're taking all of the skills that they've been learning with Peace Games throughout the years, and they're putting it together in this song that they're distributing to the to the whole school when it's done. They're also creating album art for it. They got the whole eighth grade involved in this. There was there's three students who maybe carried out of out of. 50 in the beginning, and now they got the whole grade really into it. They're really engaged, and and this is, that's their that's their peacemaker project. And they also want to they really psyched. They want to get a record label. They want to they want to work with the community. You know, it's crazy, but it's 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 great. It's it's great to see. Another another one. We have two schools, St. Patrick and Cathedral, that we work with that are more in the south and Roxbury area. And there's some there's some crime and violence that goes on in that area. And there's different streets that are considered hot spots and whatnot by the by the children of the middle schoolers. And so the middle schoolers at these two schools recognized that, and they they decided that they wanted to do a project with their with their peace games teachers, uh, that was a peace march down one of these streets, and so that they had they had students from one school and students from the other school that are that are about a mile or so away, and they marched and they met in the middle, and they had police officers involved, they had community members involved, and they and they all they all rallied around this day, and it was it was a, the principals were there, it was it was a really great event and it meant a lot to the to the community because you had community members coming out of their doors wondering what's going on and also meant a lot to the students and that's something that that they're going to really build off of this one the next one is, is a group of kindergartners uh, with a really excited with a really excited kindergarten teacher and uh, they decided they wanted to work with children in Colombia because they knew we do work in Colombia and they know of all the the violence that's going on there it's much greater than it is necessarily here in Boston and so they did. They did a, a project with students in Colombia, connecting the two, uh, and learning about what's going on there, what's going on here, and how they're playing the same game. So when they play the hula hoop game here in Boston, that that can also be happening in Colombia, and that and that means something. And then they ended up doing after after the the connections, they actually raised money to help fund some of the peace games program programs in Colombia. So you have kindergartners here in Boston, learning about peacemaking when they're in that age, and then being able to raise money for students in another country to do peacemaking. Uh, one of the one of the last two ones I'm going to share with you is my my group of fourth graders, group of fourth grade boys. They were given to us because they thought peace games was the only way that they could be dealt with. They had no solution for these group of boys, and over the course of the year, we've we've really worked with them full on. It was just a group of five or six of them, and tried to do a community-based project with them, uh, play games with them, get them really thinking about things. Most of the time, they're running out of the room, not interested, but. We finally got to the root of what's going on, what, what, what's an issue they care about, and that was gang violence. They were really, they saw it, they experienced it, and they didn't like it. So this, this group of boys who didn't really have too much to say all year decided that they wanted to come, that the only way that they could change that was to come up with laws and legislation. A fourth grade boy looked at me and he goes, we need to come up with legislation, it blew my mind. Uh, and, and so we, that's when we, we started our letter writing campaign to the governor. And we worked on it for a few weeks. They created a documentary of the boys talking about what they had done, what they had seen, what their families had seen, and we sent it to the state house. And a few weeks later, we got in touch with the representatives, and a few of them came into the classroom and really talked with this fourth grade group of boys about peacemaking and how important it is, the work they're, they're doing and they're thinking about. And, and to take that step with them, now you see, you see them every day, they're, that's all they're talking about. We have pictures up in the school about it, and it's just creating this, this culture shift in these, in these boys. And I think the last story I'm going to share is uh, one that's also a personal story. I was at the Stop and Shop up there on Mission Hill, and uh, I, so I ran into Javier, one of, our, one of our younger ones, but it's a little, little crazy. He usually runs around the school, sometimes leaves the building, and never, never really gives the administration at the school uh, a fair chance. And you know, it's always like Javier this or Javier that or calm down Javier. Or, you know, it's always it's always a pretty crazy time with him. But saw him at Stop and Shop. He goes, "Hey, Mr. Alex, Mr. Alex." Pulls pulls me over. We go over to his parents. The parents are there, and I get get introduced. Say, "This is mom and dad. This is Mr. Alex, my Peace Games teacher." I'm like, "Oh, hi. You have a you have a very energetic son, and <laughs> to say the least." And and he's, he basically after I say that, he cuts me off and he goes. And Mr. Alex and, and me, we're, we're learning about peacemaking in school, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a peacemaker someday. And that, and that to me, that, that was just kind of really, really why we do the work we do, so. But it's, this is, these are some of, the, some of the students I'm talking about here. I should put that up earlier. 
but because it's not all about the numbers and how many children you're working with, it's about it's about these guys here working on different projects. They did a project with a, with pennies for Pakistan, where they're raising money for these schools that are getting built in Pakistan. It's a it's a great book. Um, a lot of different projects and students here from some of our different schools, uh, but. It's not, it's not as easy as it sounds for us with the success stories. It's been, it's been crazy. I feel like we're all, as, a, as social change through peace games, we're caught in the middle of a lot of things. Uh, three of the most difficult institutions out there. Uh, we, are, we're, we try to hold together a public school, a university with college students, and a nonprofit organization. And I always feel like we're kind of spinning in the middle of all of that, trying to, trying to hold ourselves down to sustain this peacemaking program that matters so much to the children. And sometimes it looks like, looks like, feels like that. A uh, little, little crazy, but in the end of the day, when you, when you get results like this, then, uh, then it feels a little bit more like that. So, <laughs> so uh, I, I guess, why, do, why does all of this matter? Why does peace games and social change through peace games, why does this, why does this matter at Northeastern in, in regards to youth violence and a community approach from homicide to hope? Uh, in, in my experience, the last few years, it's because there's two communities, two, two communities right next to each other, the Northeastern community and the local community. And they always don't share the same vision. They have their differences. But in my experience, when you take the, the time, the passion, the care, the dedication to bring together a holistic peacemaking program, working with these children, working with the community members, connecting college students and local community members in, in informal settings where they're not angry with each other or they're not uh, in disagreement, then, then you can you, you find out that a small, active, engaged group of citizens can can really change the world, one community at a time. So, thank you. Oh, there's a question. became very successful. One of them was a top young man, worked for Marshalls for 41 years. The other one went to English High, graduated, went to two years at Harvard, but he met a young girl and mother said, no, no. Sent her to Reuben, he went in the military, was in the Air Force for, two, for 20 years. He's been out for a long time, he's 59 years old, and Uncle Sam here called him back. It's a big shot. Right to this day, he wrote me, he got the highest award they have won about for what he's done there from, from October to December of 2007. My mother is gone, but she made a man, and she groomed them boys. She would he'd go out in the street, and she would find them, and she would blast <coughs> me out, and, and like I said, she made it like a So when she passed away, my brother said, at her funeral, he said to everyone, I never feared no one, not even my commanders, as much as I feared that one. <laughs> and as I go along, I never trusted my daughter with no one. She was either with the family, I was a working mom, and I got home, picked her up, she went to nursery school, and I groomed her. 
When I'm talking about education, I was not a brilliant girl because I happened to come in with the Humpty Dumpty area, area, okay? But I didn't want this little girl to be a nobody. And I saw the difficulties of the stereotyping at the workshop towards me. I said, I was not gonna let that happen to her. I groomed her. I talked to her. I explained it to her. I worked two jobs. I scrubbed floors to put that girl in parochial school. I worked with those nuns. Tell me what the problem was. And I go home on a Saturday morning was the showdown. Where's all the books? Because one, one equation will make a difference because it can come back to haunt, haunt you. On the other hand, you've got to let the children be aware how much important is what really education is. You could get a job. You've got to pass that test to get the job. So you have to be smart. You've got to know these equations. You can't take shortcuts in education. So that someday when you get married, or you get a divorce, or your husband get, there's an accident. He runs, goes to work, he may be in a car accident, he may get sick. But you want to have that piece of paper so that you'll be able to take care of my grandchildren someday, the same way that I'm grooming you. Well, I want to tell you something. She called me in Vermont. She was 30 when she got married. She says, Mama, I was very, very scared of you. I said, for well, what? Oh, you know, you made me take this course and that course, this science. I said, well, you said you want to be a doctor. You changed your mind, but I told you one thing. You're going to take all your science because it may come back to haunt you. <laughs> sure enough, something came up. She had a job, was able to administer medication to children in her house. I want to tell you, everything plays a part, okay? These girls today, all because they were not helped to know about how to take care of their bodies, on the truth of the matter, is that their parents were up there doing drugs. What are you doing to your child when you bring that baby in the world that you destroyed and you poisoned it? You know what, women, you are the strong-boned person. Everything is on television, the news, things that weren't there many years ago. If you find a gentleman and he's not really a man, you take him to the doctors and see that he's okay for you. Because we are now living in a different society that now they marry you and turn around and say, I'm gay. And then you get a guy that marries you and you turn around and he got another woman in another state and he's getting rid of you. Well, you know what, young ladies, it's over. Because I don't care if you're a man or a woman. You are responsible for bringing that baby into the womb and bringing it into this world. And if you can't do it right, that's why the children is all confused. They come in here, they, the doctors give them middling. You got all kinds of problems. Why do you hurt the babies? You weren't hurt. And if you were hurt, drop it. Go on and just focus on that child. You can't have it two ways, my dear. Yes, I was a working mom. And you know what? always left my job, anything. And I was the most active single parent in the schoolhouse at St. Patrick's and in her boarding school. <laughs> you know, being this homicide thing, yes, it's a community, some of them not gonna understand. But you know, 90% of the world, Professor, is this drug war. And I'm telling you, why don't these women take their little boys and dress them up and take them to see some of the programs in the movie, act like a date? They could do better than that. There's more to, yes, yeah, these programs is good, but the, where is the, what is the responsibility of being a mother and a father? Look at that little boy that got shot the other day by his cousins or whatever. No people, that, I don't get it. You know, it's, all little children are now become little hostages in little prisons, and it's sad. So I want you to know, keep it up, young generation, and make the change. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering what I can do in my day-to-day -day life to help, I don't know, the community or reduce, reduce violence or anything. Are there any little things I can do? Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's... 
But there, I can. I there's, there's lots of organizations, I mean, for anyone in the room, whether you're an adult or a college student or a high school student, whatever it is, there's lots of organizations in the, in the community like City Year or, or volunteer, sure. you can volunteer with the 10 Point Social Change Through Peace Games. There's, there's many different ways that you can probably spend an hour to 10 hours a week doing this kind of work and really being out there in the, in the field and making a difference. I, mean, I, would, I would say, you know what your passions are because if, if you're volunteering someplace where you don't really care or you're not connected to, then it's not going to make a difference, you know? Or, or at least for you, it's, you're going to leave there and say, why did I do this? And you won't continue. I'd say research and find out what programs are out there, what organizations that serve sort of where your interests are. And I think that's the, I think that's the best thing you can do is, is really find a great connection for you that really ties into kind of what makes you be. I was wondering if there was any um, training at the moment for students um, to join the um, Peace Games that weren't a part of Northeastern? Yeah, if you want to, well, not, not right now, but if you come fall, we're going to do our Boston Y training again. Uh, fall and spring, we do it. And you're welcome to look out for us then. If, if you, I can write to my email address, or if you go to peacegames.org, and you can definitely be at the training, and we'll get you in there. Thank you. Yeah. Do you know of um, any, anything of peace games going on in Rhode Island? Because I go to school in Rhode Island, and, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, and well, I participated in peace games back when I was like in the fourth and fifth grade in New York. What, what, what school? Um, Columbia University. And oh, okay, my students okay. from Columbia University yeah. come to my school once a week, and we de-escalating and escalating situations. And then we had the peace games festival at the end of the year. It was amazing, and I miss it so much. And I was wondering, like, whatever happened to peace games ever since then? Because I haven't heard anything about it. But now that you said it, I was wondering if there's anything going on in the state of Rhode Island, or how can I implement that program in my school and get students from Johnson Wales community involved, as well as the Providence community as well. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, we get we get hundreds of requests year round for bringing it in all over the U.S. and around the world. But uh, an, e an easy way you can do it, and we don't have any direct programming in Rhode Island, so if you're here in Boston, then you can definitely get involved. But if, if not, then uh, you can go to peacegames.org. We have curriculum resources. If you if you've seen it in action before, uh, we can we can we can give you some of the resources we have, some of the training, some of the classes, all that kind of stuff so that you can you can implement it on your own and take take what you want and, and do that because that, that's great. Uh, we, have a, we have a lot of different student movements like that that kind of spur up and it really makes a big difference in the community. So that's that's, that's great. And at peacegames.org and you have our uh, email address on that. So. Thank you. Well, I have a question. And I'm uh, an alumna here at Northeastern University, and I'm also a community activist. Um, I was wondering, as you know, three people who are so involved in the community, as most of us are here, what do you, how do you feel about involving businesses and making them accountable for what's going on in the community? Um, as director of the Ten Point, you said that you have uh, partnering with industry. Um, I feel as though the majority of people who are involved in community service are in social sciences already, sociology, human services, etc. What are we doing at Northeastern as well as in the community in order to engage business and engage um, those places that are giving jobs or trying to give jobs to youth and to those who are trying to attend colleges, you know, architects and accountants and bankers. Um, I feel as though a lot of the programs right now are aimed at making tiny peacemakers, which is fabulous, but how are we bringing those into the businesses that do have the financial monopoly over such a great city as Boston? Oh. <laughs> well, at the 10 point, we engage businesses to, um, we have group of vice presidents and presidents and CEOs that we've been engaging to mentor young people, um, especially young people who come from hard situations. <clears throat> because we understand the need for relationships. <clears throat> so if I'm, a, if I'm a CEO and I know no one from Roxbury, Dorchester, chances are that, that 
I don't really care much about Roxbury, Dorchester. But if I know a young man or young woman who I hear their story, um, I hear about their friends, about what, li what life is like, then I'm more open with resources and what it's time to plan on what we do in our business, then I can think about that young person. And it may be opening the door for jobs for those young people, um, or it can be putting resources in those communities. So that's, that's kind of one way that, that we've been engaging that conversation. I think the other piece is we've been using space downtown to have youth forums. So here come 20 young people who probably never been in a building downtown, go up to the 40th floor. Um, their best, in, you know, the, the, the company has, um, we've actually taxed them, so they, not only are we using their space, but they give us a donation. So these young folks have um, gone through etiquette classes, they've um, all bought suits, so we've gone through the ringer of how to dress for success. They've got them little briefcases. And so now they're having their youth council meeting in a downtown office. And they get the first thing they do is see the views. They go to the offices and now they start to say, well, how do I get here? Like, how do I take, you know, how do I get in this job? Well, you know, these are the things that you have to do to get there. So we have these once a month conversations. And sometimes I'll tell you, we just go downtown and eat pizza in a soup, in our office. I tutor someone. And those conversations weren't happening in a lot of law firms and businesses, but they got to read kids and, and they, those kids became real to them and not just an after school <coughs> snapshot on TV. I'd like to add something. Um, uh, certainly the Private Industry Council has generated lots of jobs for, for youngsters uh, during the summer months when they're bored and unsupervised and and that's terrific. But my sense of it is that the nonprofits are they've dominated the, the community service field. And and I think that there are a lot more places where uh, companies can profit for profit companies can make a big difference. And I was just thinking about something like um, Liberty Mutual, uh, whose commercials emphasize social responsibility. Liberty Mutual has a foundation. I wonder, I mean, I know that they do some work, but I'll bet you that uh, if, if some, with, through concerted efforts on the part of activists in the community, uh, they could put their money where their commercials are. Opportunity in all of those areas. I know there's there's uh, there's a slew of, of different organizations that are involved in peacemaking work or just after school programs and, and lots of different communities. And I would take Emmanuel's advice from before and really research and see what's in your area. Uh, even go to the town hall and see what sort of kind of programs that that you can get involved in. But in terms of peace games, uh, we're not necessarily in all different parts of Boston. We have, we're only in about 20 about 25 schools and. But uh, if it doesn't doesn't mean it can't get brought to those areas. It's, it really depends on the, the people that want to bring it there. If they have the, the resources and they have the drive to do it, then 
uh, it's definitely possible. It's just a matter of approaching us and seeing what we can do, or or if there's already organizations established there, kind of finding those and seeing what you can get involved in. Yeah, because there there is a need in, in all the different areas, not just Roxbury and Dorchester. <coughs> just we, we don't necessarily have the resources to serve them all at the same time. <coughs> yeah, you, you, most communities have boys and girls clubs. You know, so there's grassroots organizations, then there's these national model organizations. So you have the boys and girls club. You have the Ross, the YMCA's that you can go to. You can go to most schools, and 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 you know get three or you know get ten or twelve of your buddies and say we want to do after school program. It's gonna charge you nothing, you know. We're we're go, we'll we'll be quarried and sorry so that they can check your background and make sure you know you're the right type of person. Um, and you can have a program as long as you know. They, there's need. There's great need. And as long as the school not fitting the bill because they don't have the money, and you you're just giving your time and your creativity, and and kids are learning something and you're engaging them, you can start your own program. You know. So it, I think it all it all depends upon what you want to do, what your interests are. And, and how tenacious you can be about it. Uh, I guess at, at Northeastern, there are uh, plenty of opportunities. Uh, in the course that I mentioned earlier, uh, social conflict and community service, uh, there, there are stu our students have uh, have served as uh, teachers aides in uh, in Chinatown. Uh, they've uh, they've taught English and math to immigrants from Asia and Russia and other areas of the world. Uh, they, they've gone to Cambridge and, uh, the, the, do you remember the name of the, oh God, Cambridge uh, Multicultural Arts Center. They, they, they played an important role in putting together uh, uh, panels on racism. So, I mean, they've been around uh, in many communities, not just the one that immediately uh, uh, surrounds Northeastern. But obviously, I think Northeastern has a special interest in this particular neighborhood that surrounds us because that's where we're located. We would like to, uh, I think it, it makes sense to focus a little bit more here than we might focus on, on some other areas of the city. Actually, I have a question for Emmanuel. Um, it sounds like a lot of your programs are primary and secondary intervention. I was wondering if you have any programs that allow people that have been incarcerated to access legitimate opportunities in any job training or any skills training programs. Um, do you have any available? <coughs> you know, you know, we, we also run a reentry program, um, but because of time, I just. <laughs> We don't want to say everything we do. We do have a reentry program. You know, we have caseworkers that find opportunities for young men um, and ladies and connect them to, to apprentice jobs, um, connect them to, to some of it is work, because some folks aren't ready for a career. Um, but some of it is, is career opportunities where they, they go to apprentice, carpentry, electronics, or electrical, or plumbing, or, or something else, and they work their way through that. Um, so there are opportunities. we have time for one more question but it sounds like a lot of people in the audience are interested in connecting up with the, the panelists tonight or uh, perhaps other groups on northeast on the northeastern campus so i think we collected a lot of people's email addresses when they came in would it be useful for people if we sent out kind of a, a contact list of resources there will be <coughs> oh, um i'm sarah Kaplan from the center of human service thank you all for coming today um we will create a resource guide Great. based on what we've heard today and, and our resources at the center, which is 172 for a student center. <coughs> and we will send out a resource guide by the end of, by the beginning of next year. That's great. That, yeah. That's my promise to you. And there, there were a lot of people here. So um, if you don't receive that resource guide or you didn't have a chance to sign up, please sign up before the end of, before the, end of the night. Um, and I just really appreciate everyone coming out and listening today and seeing why feeling like they want to be involved with positive change in the community. So thank you very much.
I'm Carol Ireland from Hebrew High School, Hebrew Community Violence Coalition, and I want to thank you, Northeastern, for hosting this great opportunity. Um, I'm here with about 13 students from Hebrew High School, who are part of the VIP team, Violence Intervention and Prevention, but we were invited by Rosemary, a student here at Northeastern University, to join you today. And again, it's creating those opportunities. Um, the high school students, we now have our alumni, and from when they have one break, they come back. Um, and the high school students go back to middle schools, and they do outreach. Um, now we're being requested to go to elementary schools, they do neighborhood work. Um, it's really, that model of the mentoring really, really does work. But I think, again, reaching out and coming out to Northeastern, getting out of more college campuses, and seeing what's outside of people. Um, we don't want the staff at school going to the Los Friends to the Rochester. And we know the great work that's going on there, but the hard battle and from homicide to hope. Um, so we are really trying to learn more about what's going on in other cities and other areas that we can do so that we can kind of prevent, you know, primary prevention is what we're really here to at this point. But I again want to thank everyone's interest here and efforts. But again, for the many questions of how do you get involved, any school will welcome you with open arms. <laughs> and they may not let you go, because <laughs> we need so much help. But um, it, this is the hope that's here, and so I thank you very much. One question, and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, hi, my name is Roxana Petroni. I go to Hazel High School. I'm part of the VIP team, which stands for Violence Intervention and Prevention. And I just had a comment to make. Um, I believe that you don't necessarily have to be part of a program or some team. Or it starts at a personal level, one-on-one. -on -one. When you see that outsider or that kid who's always violent or he's always the obnoxious one, sometimes like that's the person who needs someone to talk to the most. So if you just approach that person and say, what's up, what's happening? Do you need to talk about anything? <coughs> that really does help a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists and for all of our audience members. Have a good night.